your Bibles, Acts chapter number 4 this morning. Acts chapter number 4, and we're working our way through this book of the Bible. God is taking us out of the gospel records where Jesus lives his life in ministry, dies on the cross, is buried in a tomb, rises from the dead. And we come into Acts chapter number 1, and Jesus has spent 40 days teaching his disciples and then ascends into heaven, and God's at work. Acts chapter number 2, the Holy Spirit falls on the apostles, and the church is empowered and gets its beginning, and God is at work. But I'll have you know something. The system in which that the church was born was not one that was perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Quite frankly, uh, the death of Christ was sparked by the anger and the unwillingness of the Jewish establishment to accept the fact that the Jesus, born in Bethlehem, Jesus of Nazareth, was the real Messiah. And so they were angry. They crucified him. And now the church, in a similar climate, is getting its foothold. Some people have this idea you know, we could build a church or we could see people saved and lives changed and we could see God do something in a setting like we had in the 50s and the 40s, maybe even the 60s and 70s, a season where people thought different, a time when preachers preached different. I want you to know something. There's never a season or a climate that's too bad for Jesus Christ to do his work. As a matter of fact, it is in seasons of great difficulty and persecution and the presence of a large group of people with a power and authority who oppose the Christ in which the church got its great start and founding. And it's the season in which God chose to do his greatest work. A lot of folks say that the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs and I don't like the idea of martyrdom and difficulty I'll just tell you I like things nice and easy how about you like with me amen but I'll have you know something the church had its founding in difficult seasons and I know this to be true that every step of the way when God's people chose to be faithful and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that every step they took and every breath they breathed, it was met with the peace and grace of God with a heart full of joy. Now when we look at difficult seasons in life, and we have those. We've had them in the past. We have them presently. We can anticipate them in the future. But when you have difficult seasons in life, as a child of God, do not dread those seasons. Why? Don't dread them because we have this promise that every time we face a difficult circumstance or situation, God's grace is going to be sufficient. How many of you have ever anticipated? So I'm going to give you a story. I remember when I first went to Bowling Springs Baptist Church, there was a man that I met. Now, these, these guys were really funny. They were wonderful people. He's one of the deacons in our church. And his name was Gay. He had a lot of fun with his name. He was the perfect man to be called, to be named Gay. He's, he, he used it as a joke all the time, but he was, he was hilarious. And I remember Gay. Gay was, uh, um, had been a member of the church and a deacon of the church for years and years and years and years. And he was one of the most precious men that you've ever known or met. And I remember thinking, this is terrible, but I remember thinking, not long after I got to the to Bowling Springs Baptist Church, not long after I, I had uh, gotten to really know and love Gay Robinson, I thought, Lord, I don't know how in the world I'll ever be able to stand his funeral. There were two other people like that uh, for years, for 37 years. Roy Rector was the pastor at Bowling Springs Baptist Church, and his wife, Carolyn, they were some of the greatest people you've ever met in your life. During the interim time when I was, in the time between he was, had retired as the pastor and I became the pastor, they had had to leave the church for a season. And I remember the day that Ruth and I went and visited them. 
And I wanted, I wanted to let them know that the new preacher, as young as he was, wanted them to be a part of our church. They were godly people, and they'd given their hearts and lives to the Lord. And I remember thinking, uh, when they started coming back to church, and, and I just followed in love with these two people, that I thought, Lord, I don't know how in the world I'm going to ever deal with that funeral. But those funerals, it's kind of a morbid thought, isn't it? But you know what happened? Gay went to be with the Lord, and our hearts were broken. But you know what we met? When we met that, I thought, as a young preacher, how in the world am I ever going to deal with that? When that happened, and we went to that funeral, and we worked with that family, you know what I met every step of the way? God's grace and God's joy. And Brother Roy went to be with the Lord. Get, well, guess what we met? And that thing that I dreaded, we met God's grace and God's joy. When Miss Carolyn went to be with the Lord, guess what we met? God's grace and God's joy. We faced other things, things we thought, how in the world will we ever deal with this? Trouble and, uh, and griping and difficulty and problems. But every time that we face a trouble in the spirit of Jesus Christ, guess what we meet? God's grace and God's joy. So I want you to know something. If you are a Christian and you find yourself sitting back, looking around, thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to be terrible. I want you to remember something. Your God is bigger than that burden. And the seasons of life and the troubles and the things that you dread the most, you've never been there before, or you don't know what it's going to look like, I can guarantee you something. As difficult as the circumstances were that surrounded the lives of the apostles and the early church, as we study through the book of Acts, every day and every moment and every breath they took in faith, they were met with the grace of God and joy that only God could produce. And so we come to this passage of Scripture, and this climate that the early church was founded in was one that was difficult. All through the, uh, through the book of Matthew, over and over again, we see Jesus dealing with the scribes and Pharisees and elders and chief priests and the Sadducees. It was awful, and they were awful, and they would not heed the word of God. And guess who shows up right out of the gate in the book of Acts? Peter and John have gone to the temple to pray. In the end of Acts chapter number 3, they see a lame man. They're, they're burdened for the lame man. Peter looks at him and says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. The Bible says that lame man went walking and leaping and praising God right through the temple. And guess what happened? Everybody knew the guy. He was 40 years old. He'd been lame his whole life. He'd been sitting at the temple gate for a long time. Everybody knew him. Everybody knew him. He was the community lame man. Everybody knew him. Everybody had tossed a coin in his cup on occasion. And when they saw him walking, living, praising God, a crowd gathered around. And guess what? The natural thing happened when a man is full of the Holy Ghost, Peter stands up and preaches. He, tells, he preaches to this crowd that Jesus Christ, who they had crucified, had died on the cross, had risen again, and they need to repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in Christ. Guess what happened? 5,000 people that day heard the gospel and were saved. Guess who showed up? I'll show you. Acts chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, Peter and John, and put them in hold, prison, Unto the next day, for it was now even tide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priests were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel 
that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside, out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Look with me in verse number 12, will you, this morning? The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby... We must be saved. Today's message is titled this, We Must Be Saved. We must be saved. The story is quite interesting. It has uh, some twists and turns, and I love to see it. I I, I read the scripture, and I try to see it. How many of you can picture things in your mind? And I, I like to see what's going on here, and it's quite fascinating. And it's a miracle day, and God's done a mighty thing. And here's the word. Peter has preached. 5,000 men have put their faith in Christ and then show up these low-down, good-for-nothing, dirty, rotten scoundrels who call themselves priests and leaders among the Jews. The priests, the captain, the Sadducees, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came, and they were grieved. They were grieved. They were broken hard. They were aggravated. They were burdened. The word grieved literally means like it would be the face that you have after running and exercising, exerting yourself extremely. If I've done much running, it looks terrible. Grieved looks rough. But they were grieved. They were broke. They were they were aggravated. They were. I, can you just imagine what's going on in these uh, Sadducees and the chief priests and the people of the temple and the leaders among the Jews? Can you imagine what's going on in their mind? We thought 50 days ago that we'd taken care of this. But now there's a man that we know has been lame his whole life and has been sitting at the temple gate. They probably could have called him by name. We know that he just a few minutes ago came walking and leaping and praising God through the temple. And guess what? He is screaming. Praise Jesus of Nazareth who rose from the dead. He's screaming the thing that causes them to cringe in their souls. You see, the chief priests, they did not want to identify the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. So when he cried out, Jesus of Nazareth, they cringed to their core. The Sadducees, who were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees, they hated the thoughts, the fact that he was crying out, that he was risen from the dead. They hated to hear it that there were folks leaving this message that Peter preached saying, my burden is lifted. I've been forgiven of my sin. Praise be to Jesus of Nazareth who rose from the dead. And I'll just let you know something. Instead of being happy that God had sent his Messiah, the priests were determined that they wanted to continue in their own power and worldliness and they were grieved in their spirits. The Sadducees, Instead of being willing to say, hey, we've seen another evidence that Jesus is risen from the dead. I'm going to put aside the old man and the old things and my old way of believing. I'm going to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Instead of that, they got, they boiled up. And in foolishness and arrogance, 
and wickedness, they stood against the very Christ that could save them. In spite of their rottenness, here's what happens. Well, let me back up. They oppose Christ, they oppose what's going on there, and they take Peter and John, and they attempt to scare them. The first thing they do is they lay hands on them. Then they take them, put them in hold. They put them in some type of prison cell. They put them in hold until the next day. They said, let's, live, let's give them a night to sleep on it. It's evening. Let's give them a night to sleep on it, see if they'll get right. They try to intimidate them, overpower them. And so the next morning, they gather a quorum. They gather a group, a large group of people. It's quite fascinating to me who they gather. Look at this with me in verse number 5. It came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes. Now here's the, the rulers, the elders, and the scribes. All these groups of people, they show up. They said, we've got to put a stop to this. This Jesus is messing us up. It's messing up our plans. By the way, wouldn't it be wonderful once again to see Jesus mess up the plans of this wicked world? I believe he can. I believe he can change people's hearts and lives and make homes clean and fresh and wholesome again and bless our nation. I believe it with my whole heart. The Bible says that these group of people gather at the rulers, the elders, and then, verse 6, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander. Now, Annas was the high priest. Caiaphas was his son-in-law who would become the high priest a little bit later. Then John and Alexander, we don't know exactly who they are, but the Bible lets us know who they are in verse number 6. John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Guess what happened? Annas, Caiaphas, and all their family come out. I mean, they're going to have a lynching. They're going to take care of this guy once and for all. They're going to fix this problem. And they called up the whole family. The whole corrupt family, when I see this picture in my mind, I know it's not accurate to the times, but when I see this picture, when I see Annas and Caiaphas, they got on dark black suits and those brimmed hats, and they speak with a Chicago-type accent because they're mob bosses dressed up like high priests. I mean, they had supper last night. They said, you won't believe what happened. You know that lame guy? You know him. We've tossed a nominal coin to him every now and then. You know that guy? He went walking and leaping and praising Jesus rose from the dead through the temple yesterday. And there's another 5,000 men, that doesn't include the women and children, who are claiming and professing that this Jesus of Nazareth has changed their lives. We're going to have to do something about that. Isn't that awful? But that's what they are. So they gather the whole family and every powerful person in the Jews' religion of that day and they set out to intimidate Peter and John. The Bible says in verse number 7, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? This cracks me up. The very thing that Peter needed to say and the message he needed to preach, these mob bosses of the Jews' religion, guess what they did? They set themselves up. How many of you ever stuck your foot in your mouth? That's what they just did. They get up there and at every turn, God is proving himself mighty and mightier than his opposers. By the way, don't get so discouraged by the opposers of Christ that you want to hide in some shadow. Because the opposers of Christ, they cannot stand against the power of God. It's a fact. So they stick their foot in their mouths, and the first thing that one of them asked, is, by what power or by what name have you done, done this? Then the Bible says Peter stands up full of the Holy Ghost and preaches a message. He addresses this. I like it. Verse 8. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and said to them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. By the way, he was not disrespectful. He was gracious. He operated in the Spirit of Christ. He says in verse 9, If this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole. He said, he said, if you want me to address the good deed that was done today, <laughs> every word the Holy Spirit's given, he's being gracious and kind, but the words that God is giving Peter are making these people smaller and smaller. If you want to talk about the good deed, 
Well, here's the facts. Verse number 10, he says, Be it known unto you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. He says it's in the name of Jesus. And then he preaches the word, verse number 11. He says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. He says, he says you remember Psalm 118? That's a quote from Psalm 118. You remember the prophecy? He says, you guys have set this chief cornerstone at naught. You've, you've, you've rejected the cornerstone, the foundation. He says, but this is that foundation. This is that cornerstone, Jesus of Nazareth. And the Bible says, neither is there salvation any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What does Peter look at these wicked people and say? This blows me away. I love it. Does Peter look at them? And look down his self-righteous Christian nose and tell these rejectors of Christ who'd put him in prison last night, I hope you all rot. No. What's he do? He looks at him. He says, you, you must be saved. You must be saved. Once again, the gospel is preached to these people who want nothing but the worst. Once again, God's mercy is extended and the love of Christ is shared with these people. Isn't it amazing? They reject Christ once again. They threaten. They command not to speak. They can't deny the notable miracles. And finally, they pull Peter and John back in. They let them go out for a minute. Have them come back in and they say, Don't you ever speak and preach in this name again. And Peter, the great boldness, the same Peter. Remember this Peter? Remember the, the Peter that stood by the fire and a little lady came up to him and said, aren't you a follower of Christ? No. He even cursed one time denying Christ. That same Peter, full of the Holy Ghost, what did he do? He stood there when those high priests and chief priests and the whole family, everybody that represented the Jews' religion at that time, in opposition to Christ, they said, don't you ever speak and teach in the name of Jesus again. And he looked at him. he says, whether it's right to... Obey God or you, you choose. He said, but we cannot but speak and teach and preach the things which we have seen and heard. He said, God's changed our lives. We can't keep our mouths shut. And we'll obey God rather than man. Isn't that a sweet spirit? As this passage of Scripture concludes, the Holy Spirit leads Luke to remind us of somebody. The Holy Spirit asked Luke, remind everybody about the lame man again. And the Bible says, as we conclude this section of Scripture, the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Isn't that something? God says, don't forget about the lame man. So I'm going to bring our message. That's the story. Here's the message. We must be saved. We must be saved. The hope for our future is the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing that I want to bring to your attention this morning is this. The standing Jewish order. The standing Jewish order. The establishment of the people. And the establishment of the Jewish law. And the establishment of the Jewish system. They were there. And they were in great opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. But they weren't in opposition to Christ out of godly sincerity and honesty. They were in opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was going to wreck their life, ruin their power, and change something that they held dear. What were these people doing? The very law that Moses had established, the very system that Moses had established with the Ten Commandments and all the law who, that God had given to Moses in order that the people might realize that I'm a sinner, those folks had excused their sins, they had twisted and turned the truth and turned it into a system of power that gave them authority and made people peasants. It was awful. It was awful. And so when real hope and real brightness of future and the real Messiah came, instead of embracing Christ, they rejected him. The Bible says of Jesus, he came into his own. His own received him not. The standing Jewish order. I want you to see some things that are just so sad about these people. And I want you to remember as bad as they are, Jesus is still extending mercy and grace to them. And as God's people, when you find yourself in opposition 
to someone who's being dishonest and rotten. The opposition's okay. The anger and the unkindness and the unwillingness to share the gospel with those people is wrong. So these people, here's what happens. This man is, is healed and saved. There's joy all over Jerusalem because thousands of people have gotten saved. And what was the response? In verse number 2, the Sadducees came upon them being grieved. They were grieved. They were grieved when good things were happening to people. They were grieved when lives were being changed for the glory of God. They were grieved. It's awful. They were grieved at the goodness of God. Isn't that sad? You've got, be, you got to be careful for somebody who doesn't rejoice when a lame man is healed. You've got to be cautious of somebody who isn't elated when someone's life is changed for the good. You've got to be careful and watch out because that person is not interested in the betterment of other people. That person is interested in the betterment of themselves. And so these folks are standing in opposition to truth and righteousness. They're denying God. They're denying God's word. And they're grieved. Then they invoke intimidation as a means. I want you to know something. If someone hears about Jesus and gets born again saved, you don't have to twist their arm to do it. And I'll just tell you something. No one has ever twisted my arm to preach the gospel. You know why? Because God changed my heart years and years ago. And every time I crack open God's word and spend time with God, I'm encouraged anew and amazed again at the power of God. And I've watched God change people I love. And I've watched God's grace and peace come on people in the greatest seasons of difficulty. And I, you don't have to convince me. You don't have to twist me. You don't have to prod me to do God's work. Why? Because God changed my life. Now these people, what are they doing? They're fighting. And they say, let's just use the only means that we know how. Let's intimidate them people. Look at the intimidation that's coming from the standing Jewish order. Verse number 3, they laid hands on them. That's an intimidation. They laid hands on them. They put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even tied. I like verse number 4. The best they tried to silence the Christians, the best they tried to stop Christ, to stop the church, the Bible says in verse number 4, how be it? Anyway, in disregard to what these standing order was attempting to do, God was doing a work. How be it many of them which heard the word believed? The number of the men was about 5,000. In spite of everything they had tried, there were still people getting saved, lives being changed. These folks were becoming followers of Christ. They were going to become people of great integrity and honesty and hard work and faithfulness. They got saved in spite of their efforts. Now the Bible says in verse 5, It came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes, this whole mob of people, including the whole family, the Bible says in verse 7, And when they had set them in the midst, you see this picture? You got the whole mob boss family over here, Caiaphas, Anubis, that whole crew. You got the priest. You got the elders. You got the captain of the temple who is the second man in charge of the whole system. He's there. And they knew all these people. They named them Alexander and, and uh, was Alexander and John. They named them because the people, when Luke was writing, he says, you know Alexander and John, you know those scoundrels. And so here you've got these people, and they are all surrounding Peter and John. Can you see Peter and John? When Peter's talking, he's having to do this because they're in the surrounding him, and he's in the midst of them. They surround them after they've put them in hold. They try their best to put their thumb on God's people. And the word of the Lord, the word of God, the principles of God's word, they try their best to put their thumb on them. The Bible says, when they had set them in the midst, they asked this question. Once again, they show themselves foolish and not led by the Spirit of God. No man is a match against the Lord. And the Intimidation continues. The spirit of these people, the standing Jewish order. Let's look at this. They don't have integrity and character. They have one thing in mind, what I want, what they want. And if your desire for something on this world, something in this world, I should say, causes you to be willing to sin against God to get it, I want you to know something. 
you're taking to yourself poison. What saddens me about this whole group of people, as evil as they were, as evil as they were, what saddens me, every last one of them that stood with their arms crossed and a scowl on their face, every last one of them had chosen for themselves to reject the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it sad? And the, the, it continues. They, they gather together. They send. They, the Bible says they command Peter and John to leave after Peter's preached his message to them. They command them to come back. And then they threaten them. Don't you ever speak in the name of Jesus again. Do you see the spirit of this? By the way, that should never be the spirit of God's people. And when we see it, may God give us wisdom to identify it and understand that those are folks that aren't interested in truth. Those are folks that are interested in self and worldliness. They will not be guilty of that same thing. So you have the standing order. What did the standing order need? Peter looked at him and said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What did Peter say to those folks? You, you need to get saved. You need to get saved. The second thing, the spirit of the Christians. I love the spirit of the Christians in this passage of Scripture. First of all, Peter in verse 8 was filled with the Holy Ghost. Secondly, in verse 9, Peter was confident that God had, sent, God had sent him to do a good deed. The work of the gospel helps people. It sets people free from bondage. The principles of the Word of God give us a work ethic. The principles of the Word of God give us integrity in business. The principles of the Word of God help everything. The spirit of the Christians, this was a good deed that we've done. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. He's a miracle working God and by him this man has been changed and so can you be. He keeps preaching. He preaches the word of God. Verse number 11, I love this. He, Peter's constantly, as we see the sermons of Peter, Peter's constantly preaching. He's using the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Christ to prove the point that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ risen from the dead. And he says, this is the stone which was set at naught. When he's looking at this group of people, in that group of people were the scribes. The people who were responsible for teaching the word of God. And who knows how many times those scribes had stood up with David's Psalm 118 open and read that there's coming a time when there will be a stone that was rejected. That it will become the chief of the corner. That is the Messiah that's coming. Hey, the Jews are still preaching from Psalm 118. But they won't see and they're unwilling to identify the fact that it is the Jesus of Nazareth that we worship and that's changed our lives. The same Jesus that caused that lame man to leap and walk and praise God. He's preaching the word of God. The spirit of the Christian was, it's not us, it's not our authority, it's the authority of the name of Christ and the word of God. And he's just preaching with the spirit of Christ. We want you to hear and be saved. The Bible says in verse number 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. They said, they said these guys aren't trained like the scribes. These guys don't have the clout of the Pharisees. These guys don't have the, uh, the heritage and the lineage and the bloodline of the Annases and Caiaphas in this crowd. He said these are ignorant and unlearned men. These are common. These are fishermen. But they speak with eloquence. They speak with power and authority. And the Bible says they marveled. And the Bible says this about them, verse 13. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What was the spirit of the Christians? They couldn't, when, when Peter and John spoke, you couldn't help but identify that these men were, had been in the presence of Jesus Christ. When had when did Peter been with Jesus? Peter, before the crucifixion, before Jesus died on the cross, Peter was running for his life, denying and cursing. After Jesus was dead and buried and rose again, it was that season, those 40 days, when Peter was with Christ, that the essence of Christ permeated everything that Peter was. And they said, man, he's been with Jesus just by acknowledging, just by these folks acknowledging that they had been with Jesus, they were acknowledging the fact that Jesus had rose from the dead. They had been with Jesus. There's a song, uh, Weigel, Charles Weigel wrote this song. It's called The Garden of Roses. 
And it came from a, the idea was this, that, that uh, he had been, Charles Wyman had been walking through a rose garden. And he'd come home and his wife or someone had, had noticed when he came in the door that he could smell the roses. He'd spent time in the rose garden and therefore the scent of roses was on. I remember when I was a kid, how many of you know that distinct dairy farm smell? Do you know that smell? I don't know about you. Some people think it stinks, but I love it. I, love, I remember when I was a kid, we'd get close to my Uncle Andy's farm when he had dairy cattle. And just as we were, as we were getting close, you're coming around the corner, I could smell the place before I got there. And every time I smelled, I was like, oh, I love that. And I remember you'd go there and you'd smell it and you'd, you'd smell it. And then you spent some time there and you'd smell like it. But eventually you can't even smell it anymore. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And I remember uh, on no, numerous occasions when I was helping and working out there, I'd come home. I'd walk in the door and mom be like, you need a shower. Throw the clothes out. I'm going to wash them. They stink. But I, I mean, I couldn't even smell. But I had been permeated by that glorious odor that I so love, even to this day. Now, here's the point. The Garden of Roses, the dairy farm. Here's what they noticed about the disciples. They had spent time in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ so much that you couldn't help but see it and notice it because it had permeated their whole being. Folks, I want you to know something. If you want to see success in these days as a child, as a child of God, you're going to have to spend enough time with Christ that His Spirit is all over you. And when you walk into a room, you can't help but notice it. That person. Take notice. That person has been with Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? We need that Spirit. We need that spirit. Do you know what? I'm afraid that that is not the spirit that permeates. That's not the spirit that exudes itself outside, out of God's people as a general rule. Why? Because we live in fear. We're afraid of the standing order. We're afraid of the opposition to the gospel. We're afraid of what might happen. We fear that God may not come through. We fear that we may not have that grace and peace and joy that God has promised in a season when we need it. Folks, I want you to know something. That fear robs you of what God has promised you. And if you'll spend some time with Jesus like Peter and John, you'll have the Spirit of Christ not only to represent Christ in grace and mercy and truth and power, you'll have the opportunity to stand up for Christ and see Jesus do great works in the lives of people around you. You'll have that peace and that joy when you need it. The spirit of the Christians was one, God is faithful. It was a spirit of boldness in spite of the fact that they were circled by these men, in spite of the fact that they were commanded not to speak and teach. They said, look, I'm sorry. We're going to obey God rather than man. And we cannot but speak and teach. Speak. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They further threatened them and let them go. Guess what happened? The church continued to blossom. Now, it's kind of fascinating to me in this passage of Scripture. What happens at the conclusion? What is this in this paragraph of Scripture? What does the Holy Spirit want us to be reminded of? I'll show you. Verse number 22. The Bible actually back up to verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. These people would not hear what God had done. All men glorified God. And the Bible says, now don't forget about something, verse 22. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. The man was above 40 years old. The Bible just says, hey, don't forget about the lame man. Remember the lame man that was at the temple gate? That was the miracle. The third point I want to bring to you this morning is this, the testimony of the lame man. Look what the Bible says in verse number 9. If we this day be examined of the good deed that was done to the impotent man, by what means he was made whole? This man was made whole. His story was used as testimony against the standing Jewish order. Verse number 10, the Bible says, Be it known unto you all 
and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. When we see this, we begin to understand that maybe the lame man was standing there with Peter and John. Verse number 14. Beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. What was it that kept the kept biting the standing Jewish order? The fact that that man who'd never stood in 40 years was standing. Now he wasn't just leaning. He wasn't in therapy. He had been walking, leaving, praising God. He was just fine to stand there as long as they wanted to talk. Verse number 16. The Bible says, saying, what shall we do to these men? You see this, this mob, they'd pushed Peter and John out. They were having a little conference. They say, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them. It's manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. What they, they said, the man's standing there, we can't deny it. Verse number 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. What were the people doing? The people, all men who glorified God for that which was done. The whole crowd was praising God because the lame man was standing there. The whole crowd was praising God because 5,000 men had given their hearts and lives to Christ. The testimony of the lame man is something we need to pay attention to. How does that apply to you and me, preacher? I'll tell you. Number one, you may be that proverbial lame man. You may be watching this morning online and you're sick of being ruled by your sin. You're sick of limping through life because you will not repent of your sin and put your faith in Christ. You may be sitting here this morning and you're sick of the sin that's causing you to wreck your life and you've excused yourself and you've stood up for yourself and you've tried to oppose Christ but you can't oppose him anymore. I'm praying that there is a lame man or a lame woman among us that will accept the free gift of salvation, that they'll turn from their wicked ways, they'll put their confidence in Christ and get born again, saved this morning. I'm praying that God will send a lame man. There was an evangelist. He prayed every, in all of his campaigns. He said, Lord, send us a Lazarus. He was talking about Lazarus being risen from the dead. Send us, send us somebody that everybody knows is dead. And raise him from the dead, spiritually is what he was talking about. And raise him from the dead, send us a Lazarus. And I'm praying God will send us a lame man. Somebody that we know needs Christ. And if you're that person, I want you to know something. If you'll put your faith in Christ, if you'll turn to Jesus, you'll repent of your sins, you'll never regret one moment that you've lived for the Lord Jesus Christ. Get born again. I'm praying that God will save a lame man. The second thing I believe that the Lord wants us to pay attention to in regards to this, he says, you remember that lame man? He was 40 years old. It's fascinating to think about it. But he was seven or eight years old when Jesus was born. He'd been lame since he was a child. It's no telling. You know when Jesus was 12 years old and he goes to the temple, remember that? Jesus probably walked right by him. I can't help but wonder if Jesus, is think, Jesus invokes his opportunity to be God. Now this is speculation, but hey, I can't help but think that, that Jesus walks by him and winks. Hang in there, buddy. In just a few years, God's going to use you in a very mighty way. By the way, the lame man's a testimony of God's timing. God chose to use that lame. You may be going through a difficulty, but if you'll yield yourself to the power of God, that season of difficulty can and will be used for God's glory. Jesus walked by him. Jesus had seen him. Jesus had known him. Jesus had performed miracles. Jesus had overturned the tables there. Jesus had been around a lot and known him. But that lame man... I watched Christ grow up, and now he's in his 40s. And Jesus changed him. That's another testimony. If you're watching today and you say, I just keep put, I've put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off, today's the perfect time. You need to repent of your sin and put your trust in Christ. But my prayer for the church people, you're here today and you're saved. You're saved. You say amen. Isn't it wonderful? 
You must be saved. You, you are saved. Rejoice in the promises of God. Isn't it glorious? Now, my message to you is this. How many of you know a spiritually lame man? How many of you know somebody? How many of you know somebody that needs to be raised from the dead spiritually? How many of you know somebody? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to start by praying for them. And I want you to continue praying for them and trusting God to change their life. And then I want you to do something very difficult. God's put that person on your heart. I want you to carry the gospel to them. Tell them about Christ. Look on them in pity. And say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give out. What do you have? You got saved, right? You know that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and you repented and turned to Christ. Such as I have give out. Give them what you got. That Jesus changed your life. We need God to send a Lazarus. We need God to send the lame man. And we want God to do a work. And I want to see a moving of his spirit. Guess what? It all, hinders, it all hinges around this one simple truth. We must be saved. You look at trouble. You look at people that are wicked and the actions of men that just devastate you. Remember this. We must be saved. We must be saved.